Welcome, everybody. For those who are keeping count, this is actually the ninth Spark Summit. The first one was about three and a half years ago in San Francisco. And since then, we've seen tremendous growth, not only in the Apache Spark project itself, but in the community and in the adoption by enterprises as they leverage Spark to drive their data-driven use cases. From a Databricks perspective, one of our core missions has always been to help organizations transform their business by leveraging Spark to realize the full value and potential uh, of these use cases in the most efficient and effective way possible. With well over 400 customers today, we've been fortunate to work alongside our customers as they take this data-driven journey and learned a lot along the way. Today, specifically, I want to talk about a common approach that has underpinned many of these success stories uh, that we refer to as virtualizing analytics with Spark. So let's start talking about success stories and what are enterprises' aspirations. At its core, you want to take your data and leverage it to drive intelligence in the business. And oftentimes we look at it as saying, can we drive efficiency or save costs? But more so, it's how do I look at improving my existing products, driving new capabilities, new innovations, and new revenue streams. Three examples that we've heard about here at the Spark Summit that leverage Databricks and Spark are one, Salesforce, that spoke yesterday about how they take data from their CRM system and built Einstein, an AI system that can give recommendations to their users who can then subsequently be more efficient and effective in working with their customers. We'll hear HP talk today about how they gather data from all of their printers and all of their PCs to then preemptively understand what are some of the maintenance issues that may arrive and proactively reach out to customers and build a new services-oriented business. And then finally, McGraw-Hill, one of the leaders in education, who will be talking in the next keynote, actually, will talk about how they can see users going through their learning journey, gather data, and understand where are the gaps in that journey and help tailor the curriculum to ensure that they can bridge those gaps. So this is great. We have a ton of uh, success stories. We've heard from many others before. But at the same time, we've heard about organizations that struggle that don't reach their big data potential. They call the whole big data space hype. We've seen Gartner and Forrester talk about how many of the projects have failed. And so I think one of the questions that we wanted to look at is, what is the formula for success? Why is it that some of these projects don't actually work out? And what differentiates them from the blueprint that those who are successful follow? So as we look at this formula, let's start first by thinking through what are the ingredients to any recipe. And there's really three pillars of any data-driven use case. First, it's the data itself. Without data, there is no data in data-driven use case. Second is the analytics that you use on that data to drive insights. And finally, it's the people who define what those insights should look like, how to use them, and orchestrate the whole process. Each of these have changed significantly over time. So let's start by looking at what is the current state of them today. So data has been getting bigger and messier and more spread out. What we've seen is we've transformed from a world where most data in the enterprise is generated within the walls, right, within your ERP system or your CRM system to increasingly coming from outside of the walls of the data center. We hear about Internet of Things, so whether it's HP talking about data from their printers and their PCs, or for everybody who's wearing a Fitbit or a Jawbone or Apple Watch and the personal health data that that's collecting, with the number of digital touch point that users have, how you interact with the different websites, with the different media channels, all of that generates a tremendous amount of data. And also we see organizations increasingly use third party data. So for example, we see healthcare companies using claims data uh, or using genomics data or using basically media data from the likes of Nielsen or maps data or GPS and travel data and weather data. And so what this leads to is increasing number of silos that the data has had, as opposed to becoming centralized. And it's coming in various types and structures. So we've always had structured data, but seeing unstructured and semi-structured. And the velocity that data is generated and comes in, and which um, organizations are then anticipating being able to make decisions on this data. From an analytics perspective, we see more and more variety and complexity. 
So we've always seen descriptive analytics in the form of general queries and reports being created, but now we're seeing advanced techniques, whether we talk about predictive analytics with machine learning and graph computation and natural language processing and deep learning that have given rises to the Watsons and the AlphaGo's and the self-driving cars of the world. And the reality is, is that in many of these cases, the users don't exactly know what the right approach is off the bat. So it's an iterative model exploring all of the different uh, algorithms to understand which specific algorithm or which combination of algorithms is the right one to leverage. And then finally, as we de develop these models, it's key to be able to put them back into operation and plug it into an organization's decision support system. Otherwise, they don't have the intended benefit and impact. And finally is a piece that, to be quite honest, people often forget, which is the people that requires the collaboration from start to finish. Now, unless your organization has found the unicorn of unicorns, the reality of the situation is that there is never a single person or a single team that can basically drive a data-driven use case from end to end. The reality is that there's many different skill sets and, and roles. So the business analysts understand the domain what the insights mean, what are the insights we're using, how to put them into business. The data engineers can ingest the data, clean it up, transform it, and prepare it for the data scientists and analysts who then will test out all of the different analytics approaches and subsequently put it back into operation. Now, I mentioned that we're looking at this in an iterative model, so you need these groups to be able to work together efficiently, continually iterate, tune, as you want to drive changes and products to market faster. And every time you have different skill sets in different systems, it leads to inefficient handoffs where the organization's either information is lost or it just takes a lot longer to come to market. So that's the current state of the world. So the next question we naturally ask is, is today's technology adequate to solve and address some of these needs? So we start by looking at what are some of the different generations of technologies that we see out there that organizations use. The first one is the data warehouse. Right? And the data bit warehouse was frankly built for doing reporting on small data. You had a group of business analysts who wanted to understand visibility into the business, or so whether that was financial metrics or sales metrics or how's the supply chain doing, or any other data that sits in the ERP or the CRM system. As a result, they knew exactly the data that they needed. There was typically a difficult, sometimes brittle and expensive ETL process to get this data in the right form, put it in the data warehouse, that then descriptive analytics could subsequently be run and these reports were generated. So when we think about the state of the world that I just talked about, what are some of the challenges that we've seen organizations face? And one, this was built for only structured data, not any of the other types of data that we discussed. And because it was built generally for a smaller scale of data, it's costly to scale for many organizations. Second, it focuses primarily on descriptive analytics, and it's targeted at the business analysts, not the, all the other personas that I mentioned. As an example, we were working with a large gaming company that has tons of data generated as online users interact with their system. They had a data warehouse and business analysts who were regularly creating reports and dashboards. One day, remember our organization asked a simple question, which is, how many of our users are actually churning? So they did a lot of work and ETL got new data, finally get into the system and they figured out, okay, this many users are churning. All right, why are they churning? How can we determine, predict if they're gonna churn? So it's, how do we get data in that fast? How do we actually do a likelihood of churn analysis? And they realized their existing system didn't fit the bill. So to overcome some of these limitations and the types of analytics and the cost and the ETL issues, we saw the second generation be the Hadoop data lake. And effectively, the principle on some of this was capture data first, ETL it later, worry about the insights uh, and analytics and personas later. And so we saw lots and lots of data being dro uh, dropped in the data lake, and then a lot of different engines from the Hadoop ecosystem emerged, whether it was Hive for interactive querying, or Mahout for machine learning, or Storm for stream processing, or many of uh, the other systems that emerged. And it was primarily targeted at you know, the developers who could then leverage these powerful tools to do distributed computation and ETL the data and prepare it. So, as we uh, talked about the state of the world, why did we see organizations struggle uh, with the Hadoop Data Lake model? There's a couple reasons. One, still the premise was centralizing the data. As we talked about, that's hard to do. The data flow was going in the opposite direction. It was going, growing into more and more silos and being distributed. And second, one of the ramifications of mentioning to drop the data into the data lake was that 
without going through the governance and cleanup model, you had a lot of data that was actually difficult to get value out of for many users. And then second, we talk about having these uh, disparate and complex tools. So there was a lot of different engines, but whenever you talk with an organization, which is one of our customers like uh, Capital One, they don't say I have a machine learning use case or I have a streaming use case or I have an ETL use case. Typically what they'll tell you is something like, I have a credit card fraud detection use case. So what that means is I need to ingest the data, I need to clean it up, I need to run through a lot of different approaches to understand how to best detect fraud, and then I want to apply it to the data coming in in real time. That work, when you're basically stitching together a lot of different systems together, it becomes much more hard to do different data models, different programming paradigms and the like. And again, it's targeted at uh, big data developers, so it leaves out some of those other personas. So as we looked at uh, organizations uh, struggle with some of these challenges, what we noticed was that to overcome some of this, a new paradigm uh, emerged. And we referred to this new paradigm as the virtual analytics paradigm. And there was a couple of principles that came out here. So one, you could see that all the data is in different silos, obviously. Uh, there's a lot of different personas. But at its core, it's this notion that the narrow waste, so to speak, gets raised from the data layer to the compute layer. So uh, if you look at the data warehouse and the data lake, the center of gravity is the data. It's in the name. And the notion is that you're going to centralize all the data, and then you can build things on it uh, on top. The challenge is that many of the reasons why you coupled storage with data together in the first place, namely some of the network uh, latency issues, have roughly, you know, for the most part, gone away, especially as we see more and more organizations migrate to the cloud. And so we saw these users decouple compute and storage and allow their silos of data to flourish. Data could remain in their ERP system. It could remain in a solar index for searching. It would remain in their transactional database. It would remain in an object store. And instead, they would have this unified compute layer. Now, one of the key implications of that is that we talked about the importance of data governance and data management and security. You need a uniform model. So that rose to the actual compute layer. And the reason is otherwise you're left with different models for each different data store that you have, and it becomes very hard to get a single pane of glass and monitor and administer it and enforce compliance here. Additionally, they wanted a unified analytics engine that could support the wide range of analytics capabilities that they needed in a single system with a single model. And finally, enabling enterprise-wide collaboration of all of those personas needed to be a first-class citizen. So now, the next logical question is, is Apache Spark the answer, right? That's why we're all here. Everybody's excited by Spark. We've talked about the adoption of it. And in many ways, Spark seems to check the, the boxes. It was built without a dedicated storage layer so that it could connect to a wide variety of data sources. It was built as a unified analytics engine to support everything from interactive querying to machine learning to uh, basically streaming data and graph computation and through library extension, things such as deep learning and natural language processing. And it was built with a more easier to use programming interface, whether you wanted to support SQL for the data analyst or R and Python for the data scientist or Scala and Java for the data engineer. But as we worked with uh, more and more customers, many of which had basically actually even used Spark before they came and talked to Databricks, we learned that Spark is part of the answer. So in other words, you know, one of my favorite analogies is we, uh, customers would tell us that Spark is a really powerful engine and it's phenomenal, but at the end of the day, they need a car to be successful. That was the key because what they realized was all of the other capabilities that they needed around Spark, whether it was how do I get proper data management, data catalog, security, and governance? How do I manage the infrastructure and the platform, especially when we may not have the expertise in-house? How do I drive that collaboration of, across all the different users? How do I make sure that I can put production pipe, pipelines, orchestrate them, and put them in the business and operationalize them? Right? So as we worked with customers, we saw a lot of these needs. We saw them either try to cobble things together on their own or basically hack together scripts or rely heavily on services. And going back to that early principle that we talked about from a Databricks perspective, you know, one of our guiding visions has always been understand what it will take to make customers not just successful with Spark, but to realize their data-driven use cases in the most effective and efficient way possible. And so with that, as you look at the Databricks platform, 
Obviously, Spark is at the core, and we invest a significant amount in Spark itself, making sure that Spark in Databricks is the most performant, scalable, and resilient Spark distribution anywhere. But at the same time, we've invested heavily in understanding what are the other pieces of the car that users need in order to be successful, and we believe this has been a core part of all the successes we've seen. That includes the notion of a fully managed cloud platform which the, with the concept being that users get to uh, get abstracted away from the concept of how do I tune a cluster? How do I understand versions? How do I do library management? How do I worry about the infrastructure and upgrades? And under the cover, intelligently making sure it performs as well as possible, it scales to most efficiently use the resources and truly takes advantage of the elasticity of the cloud, which is key. In addition, things like a built-in data catalog uh, and optimized uh, access to a variety of different data sources built-in collaborative workspace. So we took the notebook paradigm and expanded it to say, how do business users and data engineers and data scientists best work together? Well, it's in this environment where they can share not just the analytics and code and collaborate, but oftentimes on the outputs, the visualizations, the dashboards, and quickly iterating on those, but being able to take those and put in production. At the end, obviously a critical piece is all of the security and uh, governance around it, whether that's audit, whether that's end-to-end -end encryption and REST and HIPAA certification and SOC 2, all of those all in one package. So I won't t spend a ton more time talking about Databricks. I'd encourage those who are interested in either understanding how these different capabilities and parts of the car work together uh, or who want to just frankly deep dive into kind of any of the 400 customers we've worked with and what blueprint they use to stop by our booth. Instead, what I want to do is spend just a couple of minutes talking about one use case that actually Matei and Michael touched on, touched on yesterday that I think is a great example of an organization that has transformed its business and gone on this jersey using this blueprint. That's Viacom. For those who are not familiar with Viacom, it's the parent company of MTV and Nickelodeon and Comedy Central of the world. And as a media company, at the core, what you're wondering is how do I drive greater user and customer engagement? That's it, that's what your business is built on to understand. I generate content and I need people to watch it and stay engaged. And so in the age of the digital era, you've gone to a form where now your content is consumed through many more channels, which is fantastic because it means you have much more data that you can ingest and understand about your customers. So the first thing that Viacom did was actually take all of this data that's generated and ingest it Databricks, do the ETL to build the catalog and then open up that sandbox to their data scientists who could work with the business and understand what are some of the metrics that we've seen work, right? And through a variety of approaches that they looked at, they discovered things such as if a user is watching two shows, two Viacom shows, they're three and a half times more likely to be loyal. And if they're watching four shows, they're seven times more likely to be loyal. So as a result, you can then put it in production to track how many shows are users watching and understand how do we run targeted campaigns to help and recommendations to drive them to watch additional shows to drive up that engagement level. Second thing that you realize is often in the era of now, it's not just on TV, it's streaming systems and streaming media, video quality is key. As they looked, they ingested the data and understood that one of the key things to users either staying on or dropping off is the notion that the time it takes for the first frame to load or to rebuffer every often. We've all been there. When we see the video rebuffer, we're much more likely to turn off or tune out. Now, the interesting thing is actually from a video quality perspective as you measure it, the two are inversely related. Your video quality tends to be worse when there's the highest demand and users want to log on to understand, you know, to watch the video. And what they noticed was that one, we can track this in real time and put alerts, and then we can proactively go out to users and rebalance bandwidth, because there's always excess bandwidth somewhere in the system for somebody who's kind of asleep or at work that we can shift and make sure users are having better quality. And they saw, example, the time to the first video frame using the system and monitoring actively drop to a third of what it typically is, which helps drive engagement. So with that being said, you know, thinking about the road ahead, I'd encourage everybody to check out the rest of the keynotes and the rest of the talks today. Uh, I continue to get more and more excited as I think about what the continued growth of Spark will do and what new use cases it'll bring. And with that, thank you. Enjoy the summit.